just like Tim started the day talking about different perspectives, that's exactly what I wanted to start with. So I think it's important to just hear, you know, the frame that I'll be talking from or the frame of reference as I go through this presentation. And first and foremost, I am talking to you as a practitioner. Um, as somebody who has worked with students with dyslexia for over 35 years, um, teaching many students with dyslexia of all ages, um, either directly uh, or indirectly, many students myself directly, and then many students um, under the um, teaching of teachers that I was working with. Um, so I will be talking from that perspective for sure. Um, I feel like I learn from each and every student um, something new. And I am thankful that right now I am actually working with two students um, directly myself. One is an adult who was diagnosed with dyslexia um, very recently. And um, I was asked to find this person who was very successful in life, but actually could read only at a very beginning level. And when I met him, I said, I found a teacher and that was me. And so I've been working with him since last summer. And um, we started first in person and, and now we work virtually. And I am loving that because my work got started and underway um, with individuals with dyslexia in the early 1980s. And I worked at Mass General Hospital from 1983 to 1985 in the Language Disorders Unit. Um, teaching individuals with dyslexia who were adults. And so I just loved hearing everything that Tracy was talking about this morning because it resonates so strongly. And I feel like I have been passionate about getting this into schools um, because of that work, seeing that, oh my gosh, here are adults whose lives have been so impacted because they did not get the instruction they need in schools. And so have worked to say this has to happen in schools um, so that we don't have adults, but they're still out there um, in the thousands and probably millions um, who did not get the help they need. And so I'm working with one of them. Uh, another student is actually a third grade student and I'm seeing this person in person um, two days a week and she has other three days a week with very wonderful teachers as well. And she is definitely on probably the severe end of impact with reading difficulties. So again, um, love working with her and the opportunity to learn from her as well. So that is one perspective. The other perspective that I'm talking um, from today is as an avid reader of research. Uh, I think Tim mentioned this. I, right from the beginning, I remember when I first saw Dr. Isabel Lieberman um, in the 1980s and just loved it. I was floored listening to her and say, how does this relate to my students? How does this relate to my instruction? And so I have loved reading research, looking at it, listening to it, and just absorbing it and thinking about how does that relate to students that I've worked with in the past and how does it relate to students that I'm working with now. And so I look at the research and I think about how can I do this with students and see how they respond. And as I see that and see students responding, um, that has been incorporated into our programs, our Wilson programs over the years. Um, so Wilson was first published in the 1980s, but we just finished a fourth edition where we added a lot of work in morphology, which had not been in previous editions um, because of reading research, going to sessions, learning about it, reading more about it, and then really digging deep into seeing how does this work with students and watching them respond. Um, so, and I think Tim knows um, we get carried away talking about research and, and spending hours and hours um, just loving to have those discussions about how this really impacts students in, in real life in the classroom. Um, I, as we go through, you're going to see I have many citations to research 
um, that are in the talk that I'm going to give, um, and that all of these things I have seen in action with both normally developing readers, but especially with those students who are dyslexic. Um, hopefully you have the handout, and if you do, you're going to see that there are also um, places where I'm not going to mention things, but they're in the handout just to support you. Um, and there'll be places where I say, you know, this is strictly coming from my experience, not necessarily from the research, um, but my experience over and over again with students. Um, this is what my experience has shown. And I will say that, you know, this is what it's shown from my experience, but that more research really needs to happen um, to confirm it. So let's get started and take a look at the agenda. So what we're going to talk about this afternoon is what is orthographic mapping and how does it occur? What is orthographic memory and why is it important? We'll relate those to Aries phases of reading acquisition. And then most importantly, get into what are the keys to instruction that facilitate this orthographic mapping and memory. And we'll first talk about how do we get it underway and then how do we move into those more advanced um, levels. And then how orthographic mapping and memory requires practice, practice, practice. And then I will just do a quick summary. So let's get started with what is orthographic mapping and how does it occur? So what we're going to be doing this afternoon is I'm going to be really talking about Dr. Lanier Airy's work um, on orthographic mapping and memory. And she is the one who both defined it, um, well, named it and defined it and explained it. And my goal today is to just help translate that into um, instruction in the classroom. And so let's just start with orthographic mapping and what does that term mean? And I like to describe this and explain it in terms of thinking about a word like hat. And if you look at the word hat, it's H-A-T. Those are the letters that make the word hat. But if a student just knows that by memory, that H-A-T makes the word hat, but doesn't know why that is and simply just knows those letters make the word hat, they haven't mapped it. And what mapping does is make a connection between the pronunciation, hat, and the letters. And so hat is pronounced, and, and you can hear it, you can pronounce it, and hear the at together, hat. But if a student has instruction, that allows them to understand those letter sound correspondences, then as they hear it or say it themselves while they're looking at the word, then they're able to make the connections that connect the at to the letters. So what they hear to the letters that they see. So my adult student is a perfect example of a student, and this is what I saw over and over and over again with adults or any older students. We have worked extensively with middle school and high school students, but those students beyond elementary grades who have not internalized the system of how words work and instead have tried to memorize words, what my student that I'm working with now did and came to me um, knowing many, many words by memory. And some of those words were short, short words like hat or cat, and some were very long words, but he knew them by just simply looking at them and knowing that makes that word. But if he saw a word like that, V-A-T, or another three sound word like thug, T-H-U-G, that he had never seen or had not memorized, he would have no idea what that word was or how to figure it out. So it's different, orthographic mapping is different than just learning the words by memory. It is being able to look at that word and map it out. And that is exactly what had to happen with this student where he had to learn the process of how to map it and then look at it 
and map it to help get it into his memory in a different way than strict memorization. Goal then is to have a student be able to look at the word hat and not just know it from memory, but to make that link with pronunciation and meaning when they see that word in a book. This is true for short words like hat, but it also happens with long words. So a word like athletes, if a, an individual, and I love how Tracy called them scholars, um, if a scholar is looking at a word like athletes, um, if they don't have a way to map the word, then they might have to memorize athletes is athletes because it's A, T, H, L, E, T, E, S. Those are the letters, that's the sequence of letters that make that word athletes. Um, but if they're able to map, when they're pronouncing ath, they can make a connection to the letters A-T-H to what they're hearing, ath, and they have a way to make that connection and leet and the suffix s. So even with long words, and very importantly with long words, um, they're making those connections um, as opposed to doing it by memory. So how does orthographic mapping occur? We're gonna talk about how it occurs through decoding, through encoding, and simultaneously viewing a word. Um, so those are three ways that mapping can happen for a student, um, but that will only happen. It requires an understanding of the alphabetic principle and at more advanced levels, knowledge of syllabic and morph morphemic spelling units. So simply the alphabetic principle is just that understanding that letters represent sounds. Um, so M represents the sound M, mm, F represents the sound F, or PH represents the sound F at a higher level. Um, so PH and any letter or letters is called a grapheme. Um, and then phoneme, of course, is the corresponding sound and a phoneme is the smallest unit of sound. So M is the grapheme and M is the phoneme. I'm mean, sorry, M is the phoneme. So you can say letter sound correspondence or you can say grapheme phoneme correspondence. But in order for mapping to occur, students have to have that understanding of grapheme phoneme correspondence. Additionally, so that's foundational, Additionally, this has to be followed by knowledge of syllabic and morphemic spelling units. And so to get to that unpredicted and be able to map unpredicted, if you just knew the sound symbol correspondence, it would be difficult. But to map those longer words, if a student has knowledge of those syllabic and morphemic spelling sound units, it's going to greatly enhance its, uh, the, the underlying skill needed to do the orthographic mapping. So we said orthographic mapping happens in three ways. One is with the decoding process. And with the decoding process, you have students learn that yes, M is M, mm, E is F, N is N, but how do you blend that? So the decoding process is actually not just knowing the letter sound correspondence, but how to blend it. So men and reading across that word. And if a student is looking at a word and they know grapheme phoneme correspondences and they decode a word, then they can actually be doing that mapping process. And I have to say, this is this was one of those things that was a big aha to me because I can literally see this happening with students like my adult. Now he could look at that because he learns the sounds and he can figure it out. And when I watch him doing the decoding and figuring out words that he doesn't know by sight, I almost can see into his brain and watch him map the word. And it, it's just amazing to watch uh, a light bulb go off as they do this. Encoding is just the opposite. 
So encoding is the process of transferring phonemes into graphemes. So if you hear the word pet and segment those sounds, pet, so encoding actually requires segmenting of the sounds, and then know that p is p, f is e, t is t, then that's an encoding process. And orthographic mapping is occurring when students are able to do this encoding process. So ways to do orthographic mapping, both decoding and encoding, um, not by memory, but doing this process is doing that orthographic mapping process. And then simultaneously viewing a word and connecting letters and sounds as it is pronounced. So what we were just talking about was a student doing the decoding and encoding process. But here is they might be listening to somebody reading the word, but having a student listen or let's say individual words, words in isolation, pet. If they are looking at the word pet, but don't know the phoneme graphene relationships, they're not going to be doing any mapping. That's not going to occur. But if they do know those phoneme graphene relationships and phoneme segmentation skills, then if they're looking at the word blast and somebody reads blast, then while they're looking at it, that mapping is occurring because they have the knowledge to make that mapping process happen. And same thing with the longer words. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is if you're reading to a student and pointing to words, say uh, it, you're a parent and you have a, a student you're reading with, if they don't have the underlying understanding um, of what's happening in those words, when you're pointing to the words, they're not doing the mapping because they don't have the underlying skill. But if they do have those underlying um, understandings, then pointing to the words helps them form connections between what they're hearing and what they're seeing. And it might be something that is being read to them or even if they're reading it themselves. So if they're reading it out loud themselves and hearing themselves read it and, and are saying the words and making those connections because they have um, learned those underlying skills to make the connections while they're doing it. So I like to think of it really basically with the word connection. Orthographic mapping is making connections while you're looking at a word or while the student is looking at a word and hearing it pronounced or pronouncing it themselves and seeing what's happening in the word and understanding what's happening in the word. And I'm just going to share with you a story of a this is actually this actually happened in my very last lesson with my adult student and we were reading a page of sentences that contained words in each of those sentences that had elements of words that he had learned the underlying process for so that on the page the words essentially on every sentence were things that he had learned the sound symbol of relationships or the um, base word and suffix understanding of the words. And so everything on that um, page of sentences he knew. He read them nicely, he read them through. And at the end of the sentences, I said to him, OK, I just want you to stop for a second and look at that page and just look at the words and see how you know what's going on in all of those words on the page, that you didn't do that by memory, that you actually can look at those words and know what's happening. And he looked down and, and he looked over the words and then he looked up and he was crying and he has cried many times in the lessons. And he said, I know the code. And that is a description of orthographic mapping. They know what's going on in the word. He knows the code because he had the, the underlying understanding of what was happening in those words as he was reading. So why is this important? So let's talk about orthographic memory. So 
we talked about orthographic mapping, making those connections. Well, orthographic memory occurs when these connections are retained in memory, along with the meanings. And so we don't want students to be decoding words. And in fact, when when my student read those sentences, he wasn't individually decoding the words anymore. He was reading them pretty fluently and pretty automatic um, because he had those words in his orthographic memory now, but it wasn't memory like his old kind of memory. So orthographic memory happens when those mapped words are seen in multiple exposures. So they're seen um, over and over again in reading. It might be reading words in isolation, reading words in sentences, reading words in passages, it might be spelling words, but those words mapped get into memory. And this is what skilled readers do. So skilled readers must recognize words. And my guess is when you saw that, you said instantly in your own mind. And that's because you're a skilled reader and you are able to absolutely look at that word, it has different parts to it, different sounds in it, but you are able to just look at it and read it like that. Memorization is possible at a very beginning level, and I have seen many adults, the one that I'm reading included, um, have memorized a lot of words, and impressively a lot of words through strict memory. But you might be able to read words at the beginning, but think of every single word. If you were trying to say athletes, okay, that's A-T-H-L-E-T-E-S. Okay, that word's athletes. Um, it's just impossible to do that for all the words in our language. So orthographic mapping and memory are mental processes used to store and remember words. It happens when a child maps pronunciation of a word to specific letters and then stores it in their visual stores that visual image of the word in their memory. So it's really with that transition of knowing how to decode it to rapidly and automatically reading it on site. So automaticity is recognizing the pronunciation and meanings of written words immediately upon seeing them without expending any attention or effort to decoding the words. And that word automaticity, I always loved this description by Dr. Ken Pugh about what automaticity of reading means. And he describes how skilled readers can actually distinguish between guy and gal, looking at it in 200 to 300 milliseconds. Now, I have no idea how fast 200 to 300 milliseconds is, but I can only imagine it. Yet. I know it's very, very, very fast. And that's what skilled readers do. So that fluent decoding and that fluent um, automatic word reading is not going to be everything for proficient reading, but it is essential. And we've known this for a long time. And that means reading quickly, words in isolation with that automaticity, and also reading words within text. So that kind of gives us the um, underlying understanding, hopefully, of what orthographic mapping is and what orthographic memory is and why it's so important. And I'd like to just quickly take you through Gary's phases. And this is, there's many different theories of reading development. And I don't know if there's one right, one wrong, but I can definitely relate to Dr. Eri's phases um, in describing um, the pre-alphabetic, partial alphabetic, full alphabetic, and consolidated alphabetic phases of reading and the automatic phase um, in terms of word level reading. So pre-alphabetic 
is that time when students are doing it by memory. So they learn to read and they're not really reading. Um, they might get excited and think they're reading, but they might see a stop sign and know that that's a stop sign and it's the shape, it's that it's at the end of the street, it's that mom is stopping the car, whatever it is, and they say stop and everybody gets excited because they read. But basically they're reading by visual cues. They might also be able to do it by pictures on a wall that say hat in a, in a picture of a hat and they might be able to say hat and think they're reading, but it's really by memorization and visualization of those cues. Um, McDonald's, reading a McDonald's sign. Um, so it's really pre-alphabetic and it's, it's not reading. It is strictly by visual memory. The partial alphabetic phase is when students are learning those sounds and correspondences and no letters, and um, they may be using often the first letter in a word and guessing. So if a parent was reading or a teacher was reading that dog had a and stopped for the student to fill in the word and there was a picture and the student does know the sound of B and sees that the word begins with a B, then they might say bone. And they're not really reading the entire word. They were really using the clues and understanding of that partial um, alphabetic um, first letter to, to make a guess of the word. The full alphabetic is when that decoding process is put into place. So at the full alphabetic phase, the student does know those letter sound correspondences, but is starting to blend and knowing how to put those sounds together to read that word hat or vat or any word thug where they are putting the sounds together to get to the word. Um, and that is the full alphabetic phase. With repeated exposure to those words, those words then um, what starts to happen with the orthographic mapping is those words, you start to bond the written word with the pronunciation of the word. Um, we'll talk about meaning actually later because the meaning part doesn't get bonded here, but um, we'll just talk about that in a bit. I'm just strictly talking about making that connection between the pronunciation and the sounds. And with that, in the full alphabetic phase, when students are doing that, seeing those words over and over again, then they start to move toward recognizing them by sight. Um, and so they have mapped it into their memory. Consolidated alphabetic phase is where students and readers use common word parts, um, common letter patterns, syllables, prefixes, suffixes, recognizing chunks to decode rather than doing it by phoning by phoning. And that orthographic mapping continues to occur at this more advanced stage, um, recognizing those parts instantly or the whole word instantly. Um, and that mapping transfers into the memory. And that is the automatic phase. When reading these words are automatic, almost effortless on site. So automaticity is recognizing the pronunciation and meanings of written words immediately upon seeing them without expending any energy. So let's get to the important part here and let's see where I am. OK, um, let's get to the important part with that understanding, what are the keys to help facilitate orthographic mapping in memory? We'll start with getting underway and then talk about more advanced stages. So getting underway, hopefully if you have the handout, you have a graphic and this graphic is an infographic really outlining what I'm going to be talking about with this first part on the left talking about getting underway and then on the right, um, the further more advanced work to help facilitate orthographic mapping. So with getting underway, we're going to talk about the alphabetic principle, phonemic awareness and phonics instruction. And the alphabetic principle is just what we talked about, establishing that phoneme graphing relationship. And it is aided by explicit teaching. So one of the things that we know with the alphabetic principle in teaching this is it does 
help that students know letter names to help them get that those sounds. So a lot of times kids come in from kindergarten, they might know their letter names, maybe they don't know their sounds, but knowing their letter names helps them access the sounds of many of the consonant sounds, um, not all of them. So if you look at letters like um, M, M, or T, the letter name is going to help access that sound, and it does. Um, with It's really interesting with those kids beyond elementary grades who have not solidified the alphabetic principle. It is actually those letters that don't correspond to their letter name that they often don't know. So a lot of times they know their sounds and it's it's predictable which ones they don't know because often it is the letters like H or W or Q U or X or Y that they have difficulty with because the name Y doesn't help them with the sound. In fact, it confuses them. They think it's the same as a, the huh sound of a W. Um, same thing with the letters G and C. Um, C helps them get S and G helps them get J. So it's not uncommon that students might say S and J as the primary sound. And of course, those are sounds of G, but it's not the primary sound. So the letter names in those situations um, will get them to that sound, but not the primary sound. So in the cases where the students don't know the sound from the name, um, those students benefit from really help with other ways, other clues. Um, and one is certainly keywords, and this is definitely in my experience, and maybe this is one place that needs a lot of research, more research, and I know people have indicated keywords um, can help with sounds, but I find them tremendously helpful. So instead of having them say S as the first sound, when I'm working with an adult, which can happen quite often, then C, cat, K, to help them get that other sound, K, to give them another clue to attach to. And so that's one way. Um, teaching students mouth positions is another way to really clue them into the sounds and help them see and hear the difference between the different sounds. When you teach the sounds, you want to help them learn it in two directions. And there's probably not enough written about this other than its relationship to reading versus spelling, to coding versus spelling. But in one direction, the student looks at the letter M and comes up with the sound. So, mm, so they see the letter and come up with the sound. And that helps them with decoding. In the other direction, they hear the sound Mm, and come up with the letter. So it's just working it in both directions. And so one is grapheme to phoneme, seeing the letter coming up with the sound, and that's for reading, and hearing the sound and coming up for, with the letter, and that's for spelling. So alphabetic principle, students know their letters, know their sounds. Well, what else do they need? So let's talk about second thing, phonemic awareness. So the ability to decode words require both phonemic awareness and the mastery of the alphabetic principle. So let's stop here and just look at what this means for a minute. So um, this is the umbrella graphic, and I know some people aren't a fan of the umbrella graphic because um, they may say that it might be confusing, but I'm going to be talking about the umbrella graphic, not in terms of a continuum of instruction, but just in terms of understanding terminology and where they fall into place. So basically, I just want to share that phon phonological awareness is an umbrella term. And so it's an umbrella term that covers phonological sensitivity and phonemic awareness. And phonological sensitivity is sometimes also called phonological awareness, um, but phonological sensitivity and phonemic awareness are both phonological awareness um, tasks or skills so that you are probably better off to use the umbrella term phonological awareness and then distinguish 
phonological sensitivity for those that relate to larger units of language. So for example, word awareness, that puppy is cute, being aware that that sentence has four different words. Um, that's a larger language unit than a phoneme which is an individual sound. Same thing with sharing the syllables in a word, Wisconsin, larger language unit than just a phoneme, which is the smallest unit of sound. Um, onset and rhyme. The onset can be a single phoneme in the case of mm, at, at is the rhyme, and at is more than one phoneme, so it's a larger language unit. So what we're going to talk about today is phoneme awareness, and we're going to focus on phoneme awareness and its relationship to orthographic mapping and memory. So the significance of phoneme awareness is not overrated because it enables learners to penetrate the code that relates speech to print. Phoneme awareness is the key to reading an alphabetic system. Make no mistake, it is the phoneme level awareness skills that directly support learning to read and spell. It is segmenting and blending of phonemes that has the functional value in reading. And although there are many different skills within phonemic awareness that require explicit teaching, um, blending and segmenting at the phoneme level are the most important skills as they lead directly to decoding and encoding. And so what the purpose of with reading is um, phonological awareness, let's just say the purpose of phonological awareness is to help students read and spell. So all of what we were just looking at was when we're talking about reading and spelling, what are the key things in particular under this big umbrella that really directly are applied to that reading and spelling task. Phoneme segmentation, the ability to pull apart sounds in a given word is a critical phonemic awareness skill for reading and spelling success. Poor readers often need direct teaching of this because of the co-articulation of sounds in spoken words. Direct instruction in this skill helps these students unlock the alphabetic code that forms the basis of the written form of the English language. So looking at the word or listening to the word map, phoneme segmentation simply means pulling those sounds apart. So if you hear the word map, saying those individual sounds, mm, ap, that's phoneme segmentation, segmenting the phone, phonemes. You can do it with tokens, mm, ap, pulling those sounds apart. You can do it just orally, mm, ap, pulling the sounds apart. You can do it with something we do in Wilson, which is tapping, mm, ap, or mm, ap, to show how you pull those sounds apart. Um, that is phoneme segmentation. Now, phonemic awareness instruction is most effective when children are taught to manipulate phonemes by using letters of the alphabet. And letters are concrete, which help them with abstract phonemes. Well, what we want to talk about here is, yes, that's true, letters are concrete. And so if a student has the phoneme graphing relationship, then yes, their phoneme graphing relationship um, understanding. If they have that understanding, then the letters make it more concrete to demonstrate what you just did. You just separated m app. And if they look at letters, m app, and they have been taught those correspondences, then that's concrete and that helps them understand it. But most importantly, it's the whole purpose of why we're teaching phonemic awareness is to get them to make that connection with the letters. So that's what's critical about the whole phonemic awareness instruction is to help them make that connection. So teaching children to manipulate letters representing phonemes in spoken words was especially effective in teaching phonemic awareness 
and it's transfer to reading and spelling tasks. So that's the whole key there. It is more concrete if they know those correspondences, but it's also what you want to teach to make that transfer. Phoneme awareness instruction should be integrated with letter instruction. So if you have tokens and tokens are there and you teach them app and they have been taught the letter sound correspondences, then go ahead and say m app and then do it with the letters and show them m app to make that direct connection. Or if you tap and just do it strictly orally first, map, m mm, app. So it's an oral exercise at that point, but then go ahead and com combine. Sorry, go ahead and make the connection. M mm, is M, A is A, P is P for the word map. So phoning awareness plus the alphabetic principle means to segment and then identify the corresponding letter. So that is what we talk about when we talk about linking this to letters. We're making the direct connection to help them understand how this relates to the reading and spelling process. So um, with this, you can progress from three sounds and even two sounds up or at, um, and then three sounds, four sounds, but first do that phoneme segmentation without consonant blends and then add consonant blends. First one consonant blend and then more than one consonant blend within a word um, and progress um, through that phoneme segmentation and corresponding letters in, in that order. So let's talk about phonics instruction. And this is all related. So research supports explicit phonemic awareness and phonics instruction for both beginning readers. So I just want to talk about here in terms of phonics instruction. Um, phonics is teaching the letter and sounds, right? And, and we talked about that with the alphabetic principles, so it's all related. But what we want to do when we're doing phonics instruction is actually teach them the decoding process, so how to blend. So if a student knows the, the sounds, mm, f, n, don't assume that they know how to then blend them together and directly teach them. So this picture I like of showing a student running their finger and continuing the sounds, men, and teaching them how to do actually that blending process. Um, Beginning readers, and I have definitely seen this over many years, many, many years of instruction with older students with dyslexia. It really does help to start with those continuant consonants in the initial position where you can hold on to the sound into the vowel. So map or fit um, rather than k at cat, you still don't want to pause between the sounds, but it's easier to hold on to the continuum and really teach them and get the whole process of blending underway. So map, oops, sorry, um, goes to segmenting when you're trying to do phoneme segmentation, you want to pull it apart. Mm, ah, p. But when you're blending, you want to do it as quickly as possible together. Map map to blend it, map, map, and teach them how to pull those sounds together. Initially, do it with those A to Z, starting again with those um, consonants that you can hold into the vowel, and eventually teach all those phoneme graphing correspondences and teach them that decoding process. So we just talked about this left-hand side, and all of that was getting um, work underway with orthographic mapping. And the students look at words differently, and that is getting them into the full alphabetic phase. Um, I want to say that Dr. Erie um, recently spoke at a conference. Um, it was at the AIM Annual Research Symposium. I think it was about two weeks ago. and um, 
I'm going to have someone put a link to her session because it was also a free session that you can see Dr. Erie talking about this. Um, but her work um, talks about how instruction is necessary to move them from that partial to that full alphabetic phase. And what she talks about in terms of that instruction to move them to the full alphabetic phase, and she said this at the conference, I'm going to read it um, with what she said, that they need to know major graphing, phoneme relationships, to be able to segment the sounds in a syllable, to use their graphing, phoneme relations to decode a word, so teach them how to use these relationships to decode, and use the orthographic mapping to build sight word memory. And that these things don't happen without systematic and explicit instruction. So that gets us ready to talk about the right side of my infographic there. And they're necessary, but they're not sufficient for those longer words. Let's talk beyond phonemic awareness and phonics. And we'll talk about phonology, morphology, orthography, and an integrated instruction with those. So that's the right side here, where we're going to talk about how can we further aid orthographic mapping? What kind of instruction is going to help kids when they look at a word, hear it or pronounce it to make those connections? And that is moving into that consolidated alphabetic phase. Systematic and integrated instruction of phonology, morphology, and orthography provides key foundational skills for word level mastery for reading. What's phonology? The study of sounds. Morphology, the study of word elements or morphemes. A morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning. So a phoneme is the smallest unit of sound. A morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning. Um, and we'll talk about that. And then orthography, the study of rules that govern written English. And so to, to look at this, let's start with what I want to say in terms of phonology. And you, you might say, well, how is phonology different than phonics? It, it really isn't. It's the study of sounds. But what I worry about when people just talk about phonics is just really doing just the sound symbol relationship. And it's a little bit more than that. And that's what I'll talk about. But from the beginning, um, what we talked about already was focusing the student's attention on the individual sounds and teaching them how to blend those together. And so looking at those individual sounds rather than doing, for example, in onset and rhyme. So instead of um, at, right from the beginning to um, at, and teaching them how to blend those sounds together. And I will tell you, I have done this with hundreds and hundreds, thousands probably, but hundreds directly um, of students with this immediately working with them. If you teach them a small set of phoneme grapheme relationships, and often they know some, so let's just take the adult. In his very, very, very first lesson, I taught, uh, made sure he knew some of his sounds and, and they were constant sounds that he knew, but others he didn't and really secure. I generally start with two short vowel sounds, A and I, and get those keywords going and, and getting him to learn those sounds and then immediately showing him how he can put those sounds, those few sounds that he's learned, mm, ah, and blend it to map. So immediately do that. And I, there is something that shows that two thirds of the most common rhymes are entirely consistent with phoneme letter pairings. So you can immediately start teaching this. And a study that was done by Christensen and Bowie, and it's been replicated too, there's other studies replicating it. Um, and I think I missed this one in my references, so um, hopefully um, we can get you an updated version of my handout that has all of my references because I kept putting more references in. But um, this really looked at students um, who really struggled with learning how to read and showing that those students who really struggled with learning how to read did better when taught 
you know, with those individual sounds right from the beginning. Um, that said, um, later, um, you can teach some additional common letter patterns that can enhance orthographic mapping. And that's something that Dr. Airy does talk about, that you can introduce those different letter patterns like ink or T-I-O-N. Now, something like ink is not a phoneme. It has three sounds, actually, it, ink. But rather than having them do that, have them learn because it is a common letter pattern um, that will facilitate that orthographic mapping um, to do that and learn those common patterns. Another thing to distinguish just pure phonics with phonology is, read that word for me, it's a nonsense word and I am guessing many of you or some of you have seen this um, with the Wilson presentation before, but if you read that as SERPA, then you understand things beyond just the simple sound um, symbol correspondences, like the position of the letter in a word. So A has lots of sounds, but here it says ah because of its position, or that the letter C does say s and k, but it says s because of the letter that follows it. So instruction, when you study the sounds um, in depth, then you might look at and understand those things, surrounding letters, position and word and syllable type. So syllable type is something that is key, but it's only key as it's taught in relationship to reading and spelling. I think that um, just a sidebar here for a second, I think that some things with the science of reading um, out there as you know, people are using that um, sometimes they say science of reading as if it's a program, which is crazy because science of reading is really re um, the underlying research that informs reading instruction. And so um, sometimes when it's used, oh, we're doing the science of reading, and what they're doing is simply teaching the six syllable types, and it's not related to what they're doing in reading and spelling, but just here are the six syllable types. Um, I'm not sure that that would be very useful. So you have to be careful when you're teaching things like this, the syllable types, that it's done thoughtfully, systematically, and in relationship to what kids are doing with their reading. So um, it is highly correlated to vowel pronunciation. So teaching them, for example, the closed syllable, where you have one vowel closed in by a consonant, that's when your vowel is short. So teaching that closed syllable concept when they're working on closed syllables and understanding, oh, so that's when it is short. So you teach them not just the, the idea of closed syllables, but if you see a syllable that has one vowel and is closed in, then that tells you your vowel is short. And so, Teaching closed syllables makes a lot of sense, and that's why so many programs, if not all programs now, start with closed syllables because it makes up almost half of written syllables in an analysis of 17,000 words. And with those, um, the vowel sound was cor correctly predicted in 95% of the words, so it's highly useful. Pencil application. Um, is another piece. So we talked about syllables and syllabication is another piece really helping students work with words and syllables. And so this was a study that was done by um, Bhattacharya, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, in Erie, um, teaching students to read 100 words and having them break them into syllables, looking at individual syllables and then putting them all together and that impact on their um, orthographic mapping and memory of those words. Um, this is one of those things that I'll say um, we do in Wilson. I've seen that doing it in two directions with that syllabication really makes a difference. I'm not sure that studies have isolated and looked at doing it in those two directions with multisyllabic words in an integrated way, um, but we see that with reading, 
showing students individual syllables like athlete when they have the um, background knowledge, the um, sound symbol relationship and the syllable understanding, and then having them divided. So providing them divided and then almost immediately teaching them how to divide it themselves so that they can read athlete and look at it and map it by syllable. Doing it in the opposite direction with spelling, hearing the word athlete and having them do the syllable segmentation. So this is when syllable segmentation makes so much sense connected to reading. Athlete is ath, pronouncing it, lee, pronouncing it, and then taking that ath and mapping that to the letters ath, A-T-H, and leet to the L-E-T-E. So working it in both directions for the mapping purposes. I just want to do a quick sidebar. When you do the syllabication, you don't want to do um, what you would hear in pronunciation in salting. You want to be sure that you teach them to do it by the base word in salt plus the ing, um, because that way you're tuning them into the word structure more than just the syllabication. Although initially they're hearing it um, with the syllabication, but teach them to really tune into seeing what's happening in the word with that base word and suffix. So that really brings us right into morphology and the um, looking at words and studying words with um, a real look of combining the morphemes, which is the smallest unit meaning, with phonemes. So that's what a phoneme is what we hear, a grapheme is what we write, a morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning, a word element is the written form of a morpheme. So when we talk about study of morphology, um, when it's the written form, the more accurate um, thing to say would be the study of word elements, which is the written form of morphemes. So morphological awareness refers to students' ability to understand, analyze, and manipulate morphemes within words, contributing greatly to their ability to decode, spell, and comprehend. As opposed to phonological awareness, morphological awareness is what we just um, what I just read to you. It aids accurate and automatic word recognition as students learn to recognize a string of letters with meaning. So hopeful has two morphemes, hope and full. And so I hope, <laughs> I'm hopeful that you can picture what I'm saying in terms of having a student who's learning about this structure, being able to look at words and look at them differently. And when they look at hopeful, if they've learned about hope and they've learned about that suffix full, then they can map it in a different way when they're looking at it. So learning things like prefixes, non, and Latin bases, um, like struct and less as a suffix and seeing those over and over and getting those um, mapped and then in memory is going to help them very much when they look at words um, in the future. And so large body of research supports this efficacy for both reading and spelling. So briefly, morphemes or word elements are either affixes or base elements. And so let's talk about affixes first. Affixes are your prefixes and suffixes. And that instruction should initially be restricted to words in which the affix, when it's removed, the word stays intact as an English word. So nothing's happening to that word. It stays intact and that's initial instruction. In a computer assisted analysis, we looked at key pronunciation was related to syllable type and 64% um, of the information about syllable type was the most reliable way for vowel pronunciation. But then next, 32% added to that for vowel pronunciation was prefixes and suffixes accounted for an additional 32% of reliable vowel pronunciation. So where do you begin with this in terms of suffixes? Well, S and ES 
account for 31% of the words that are suffixed, and ed and ing account together with SNES, 65% of the words. So it makes sense to start with those words and adding those words. So let's shift from that to complex words. And a complex word is a base element and at least one other word element combined. So disrupt, rupt is your base element, and dis is prefix, and together they make a complex word. So there are a lot of common Latinate base elements that are closed syllables. Here are some of them that, that are very common, and you're going to find these in many different words. And so teaching these, and so this is something that we added to our Wilson instruction as I heard more, listened, read more, saw, and said, wow, this can be very powerful for students to start to do orthographic mapping using these base elements. And so teaching students these base elements and really getting them to see these base elements quickly and mapping them quickly. And why is this so powerful? Well, they account, complex words account for approximately 60% of vocabulary for students above fourth grade level that they will encounter with reading. So lots of words. So let's just take, and here's another whole group that have that CT blend at the end, but just look at the word tracked or the um, base element tracked for a minute. And this is a word matrix. And what you see in the middle is that base element. And then over on the left, some prefixes that are added to it to make the complex words. So abstract, distract, extract, sub, subtract, contract, subcontract. And then the, starting with those three most common suffixes that can be added to these words. Um, all those words, abstract, distract, extract, I think I counted them. I think there's 24 words with tract just with that suffix. There's more when you start adding other suffixes, but just with that. So you can see where having them be able to know tract and see tract and understand what's working in a word is going to help them map so many words when they're reading with more automaticity. And that's a link to um, the mini matrix um, maker. Actually, I forgot to put that in the chat, but maybe somebody can add that in the chat for you. And oh, let's see. So let's go on to orthography. And orthography is that um, looking at what are the rules that govern English language. And students with dyslexia benefit from instruction that helps them coordinate phonological, orthographic, and morphological word forms and integrating it. And so that can be done. And, and again, as it relates specifically to reading and spelling and in a systematic and explicit way, not random way. And I think sometimes people say, oh my God, there's so many spelling rules to memorize in English and say there's hundreds of spelling rules. Well, that really, there are not hundreds of spelling rules. When we look at, and I think it's this next slide, I'll, I'll go back to that other one, the study of the rules that govern written language, there are just really a handful of rules that make a difference to teach students. Um, so it can be as simple as the word give is an example where words in English generally don't end in V. So if you have give, give, that's all the sounds that you hear, but English words don't end in V, so an E is added. So teaching them about that or how you would double the consonant G. And I think Stephanie was talking about this earlier today, or dropping the E. And truly there are only a handful of words, I mean rules, and teaching them in a systematic way, not in an overwhelming way. And I also highly recommend that they don't learn to memorize the wording of the rule, but they learn to, to do the application of the rule through practice. And so, yes, they can write the wording down in their notebook or something, but basically what they're doing is not memorizing the wording, but really practicing the application or learning it so that they see what's happening in a word when they're looking at a word and understanding what's going on. So that can be done. Um, well, let's 
go on to this, a meta-analysis demonstrated strong support for direct and explicit instruction of spelling as it improved both spelling performance and also improved phonological awareness skills. And so spelling is intimately related to reading and to the relation of letters and sounds. So it starts out with just a simple fig is fig and relating that to the sounds, but then it goes much more and goes much more thoroughly than just those single graphing phoneme mappings. And it's highly worthwhile to teach those spelling patterns. Start with adding suffixes to unchanging base words and eventually um, show them how it works. That gets you into, and again, this is going to be helpful for both reading words and, and spelling words, as well as understanding the meaning of words to teach them with words like blend, blended, dress, dressing, um, and then with additional suffixes, require, requirement, um, that the pronunciation remains intact. So you can see, relate to the meaning of the word and the pronunciation of the word when you add. So the derivative remains intact. Whereas where words like finality, the word is final or majority, the word was major, it doesn't remain intact. So the derivative word is more opaque. But showing students and having students understand this is greatly helpful for their reading, for their spelling, and for the understanding of the meaning, for them to recognize major or final within those words, even though they're more opaque. So what about irregular words? Well, let's first talk about terminology quickly. Terminology of regular words mean a word that contains a part or parts that are not what you would expect for the sounds in the language. So a word like what? The WH is regular. That says what we expect. The T is, but the A isn't. Um, so irregular words has a part or part of words that is unexpected. High frequency words is exactly that. They are the most frequent words in written language. So these are the words that appear most in print. These high frequency words might be phonetically regular. They might be she or for. Those totally phonetically regular, but they are very frequently seen in print. Or they might be irregular. And in fact, many irregular words are frequent. And so I think that's why sometimes those two words are used interchangeably. Um, but in reality, high frequency words contains or will have both. Sight words are simply words that you know by sight. So that automaticity that we were talking about, that orthographic memory and the automaticity of word reading, it's actually knowing words by sight, not even because of mapping, so that my adult student had a lot of words that he could read by sight, even though he hadn't matched them to, to learn how to do that. He had just memorized what letters make a word, but any word that is read by sight, um, whether it's mapped like hat and athlete, um, if that eventually is read by sight, then it becomes a sight word. Um, it can be for a little one, dinosaurs. They might know that by sight because they love dinosaurs. Um, that would also be a sight word. So the keys to teaching the irregular words is really to help students understand what's regular and what's irregular about them and point that out in the instruction. So I've got to check my time. Oh my goodness. Okay, <laughs> let me just keep going, rocking through here. Um, but what I have talked about in a very quick way is how you can do integrated word structure beyond that simple alphabetic principle and phonemic awareness to really help and aid orthographic mapping. And that doesn't just happen with a simple, oh, take a look at this word, or this is what it is. It's going to take practice. And what that means is really moving them into a more automated phase by having them retain that as a sight word because they have seen it over and over again while they were mapping it. So the instruction 
enables the connections to be activated and they need that instruction, but practice using these skills to both read and spell. And I really am wanting to emphasize spell, but I'll get there in a second. Um, let me first talk about reading. Um, and Stephanie was talking about this as well. Um, students need to have practice reading words. They can read words in isolation. They can read words in sentences, but they also need to have experience reading connected text that contains what they have been reading about. So with Wilson Reading System, and I did this way back in the 1980s when I was working with adults with dyslexia, making passages and paragraphs that only contained the type of structure that they had been taught directly. And so they have the opportunity to practice that and to put that into practice decoding themselves and mapping words as they're reading. And with that reading over and over again with words in, in exposures in different ways, um, that's going to help get it into their memory. It might involve repeatedly reading sets of multisyllabic words by segmenting them into their graphosyllabic units. Um, practice may involve having students decode and pronounce unfamiliar words aloud during reading of text. So when they're reading, if they're reading it out loud, they're hearing that pronunciation as they're mapping it. And I can't emphasize enough, they can practice with spelling. We heard at the very beginning that coding, spelling, and simultaneously reading are ways that with a graphic mapping occurs, spelling supports sight reading. And so reading and spelling instruction should be integrated so that every reading rule, and when we say reading rule, I, I, I hesitate to even use that word rule, but have them as they're understanding these different components of word structure to both read it and to spell it in an integrated way. And Graham and Hebert summarized the effects of spelling and actually the spelling effects are very high. Um, for both word fluency and word reading skills. And, and Stephanie talked about this this morning, and these are directly from um, that report, how high those effects are. So learning with this, learners with dyslexia who take part in a spelling intervention show better reading and spelling performance compared with children who receive regular school practice or no spelling instruction. And look at evidence-based spelling interventions application of phonics, morphological instruction, and explicit instruction of orthographic phonological spelling rules. So let's talk about orthographic mapping and meaning for a second, because the actual mapping or the seeing of the word and mapping the spelling, um, that is not directly related to linking to meaning. So Everything that I'm talking about, um, when you, they're seeing the word and mapping it, um, that isn't directly related to meaning unless that connection is made. So if they know the word hat when they read it and they have the meaning already linked, then all three are being linked together. Um, again, with my adult student, I can't tell you how many times he reads a word he can't believe it's that word. He knows the meaning. He doesn't know what it says before he maps it and blends it and reads it. And then he reads it and he's like, is that it? Is that that word? And so he has the meaning already there. So now he's putting it all together and really linking those together. So from the beginning, make connections with its pronunciation, its spelling, and its word meaning. We like to talk about what's the structure, what's the meaning. And if they don't know the meaning, then that's where you're going to make the connection to the meaning. And um, I like to say to teachers, there's so many different words, choose words. You can have them read words, but really emphasizing and get into the words that are core vocabulary, academic vocabulary words that they're going to um, encounter a lot rather than obscure words. They can decode the obscure, obscure words and you can quickly talk about meaning, but don't choose those to study and put into their vocabulary book. 
um, choose words that are core vocabulary words and um, as defined by Alfreda Hebert and her colleagues um, in academic vocabulary words. So link meaning from the beginning. And this is something that made a connection to me when Dr. Airy talks about this. And what she says is that connection to meaning must be made, but it is actually helped by seeing and mapping the spelling of a word helps boost the meaning or the memory, sorry, the memory of the meaning of a word. So actually mapping it helps boost the memory of the meaning. And I think I can describe this by saying, have you ever had a conversation where somebody's talking about something and they say a word that you're not familiar with? You don't know the vocabulary, you don't know the meaning. And you say, wait, what was that word? Say that again, and you want them to say it. And they tell you what it means and you're like, oh. And then you say, okay, how do you write that? And you write it down and you write it down. And because you have it, reading strategy skills, when you're writing it down, you're mapping it. And that writing it down and seeing and mapping it is what she's talking about helping you to actually make that link to remembering the word. So I was going to do something, but I'm going to skip it because of time. Um, but right from the beginning and right from the beginning, you want to build students knowledge. So at the text level, it's fabulous. If you can be reading text that is going to also build students knowledge. And I'll give a plug here for Geodes, which is a project that we did together that follows a sequence of skills aligned with foundations, but also is done following um, the knowledge building process of really building students knowledge of the world um, with great minds. And so we were able to do 64 titles in first grade, 64 in second grade and 48 in kindergarten that follows a um, decoding process, but also built students knowledge. So summary key takeaways. I'm just checking my time. So summary key takeaways. I did a lot quickly, but um, let's look at what is key to take away from what I talked about today. And first of all, while researchers have not directed, oh, before I do that, I forgot I was going to do this. Let me just say this quickly, because this is one of those things that researchers have not done enough on. And I have had lots of conversations with Tim about this over the time. And um, when I showed this here, we didn't get a chance and don't have time today to talk about how things are taught. So what we just talked about was what is taught in a good structured literacy program, but not um, how it is taught, which is explicit and um, systematic we talked about, but it's also diagnostic and mastery driven. Um, so there are aspects of it. One thing with multi-sensory or multimodal, um, there isn't enough research to say, you know, it is taught better with multi-sensory or multimodal experiences. And so I like this quote, while researchers have not directed much attention to practice, decades of practical experience in teaching have suggested that multimodal presentations of letters, word parts, and words may be useful. And so we have to define what multisensory means because I think that's part of the lack of research. What does that mean? And maybe it means different things. And if we define it, for example, does it mean, and, and I think one aspect of it is saying the word, hearing the word, and seeing the word at the same time. Um, is it the manipulation of letters? And if you see Weiser and Mathis study, they did an analysis of 11 um, research, um, very good research projects that looked at the manipulation of letters that really benefited instruction. So what does that mean? So that's all I have time. About that, but I think that's an area that more research would be wonderful. So let's get into the summary. First of all, there's extensive scientific evidence base for teaching children phonemic awareness, especially when combined with letter sound knowledge and explicit and systematic instruction of the foundational skill of decoding. 
that even though there are lots of different things under phonological awareness umbrella and even the phonemic awareness umbrella, blending and segmenting are most directly related to reading and spelling. The systematic and integrated instruction of phonology, morphology, orthography provides key foundational skills for word level mastery for reading. Mean effect sizes for spelling instruction involves involving phonics, orthographic, and morphological interventions are significant. Phonics, morphological, and orthographic interventions support children by making the spoken and written language transparent. That's that orthographic mapping right there. This can help build in and automate spoken and written language structure and in turn reduce cognitive load, doing it by memory. So, in summary, orthographic mapping is facilitated by direct and systematic integrated instruction in the alphabetic principle and phonemic awareness, specifically phoneme segmentation and blending, phonics teaching a process for blending and decoding words, common lending, teaching common letter patterns, syllabication, affixes, and word elements, and practice using the above skills. And I have to say, when I'm here, I just want to say that a lot of this isn't new. Um, a lot of this is things that we have known for a long time. Um, some of it is new, some of it is refined. Um, and I feel like great progress has been made and is also in the making. Um, science, which means high quality research that is translated into practice, um, it's not static, it's ever changing. Um, there is definitely a shift that is happening to get this kind of instruction transferred into the classroom. And while that's happening, there will be glitches, there will be bumps in the road, and it's not going to be perfect. But there is a lot, as you can see with all of this, there is a lot and much to do to unlock the code. The science of reading um, is, it's a term that unfortunately is sometimes being loosely interpreted or loosely used, and research really needs to continue um, to prove and disprove theories to really help us understand research in more detail to help us all translate that into practice. Um, but in the meantime, there is more than enough evidence and scientific evidence to move it into the classrooms. And there is definitely a great and urgent need. Um, I like this document by the Reading League. It is really an attempt to help teachers understand that the science of reading isn't a program um, or isn't just an isolated practice like putting syllable types up on your wall. Um, the science of reading is really that underlying research and this really helps with that understanding. And in that document, it also looks at with word recognition, what does science tell us? And if we look there on the left, it's what we've been talking about, phonemic awareness and letter instruction, explicit and systematic instruction in how to decode and encode, including word parts, syllables and morphemes, and reading connected text. So that is what we have. Um, and I think that um, we really have to realize that in this um, time of much discussion about the science of reading, we do all realize that we are at an important juncture and there is no time to waste. Teachers need help understanding the research and how to get that into their instruction um, for both reading and spelling. And I don't know if I have time. I wanted to read a quote at the end. I think I do because I, I love this. And this comes from um, the synthesis of um, research. We're um, looking at 11 high quality studies by um, Weiser and Mathis. And um, in conclusion, this is from their report. In conclusion, there appears to be quality empirical evidence supporting integration of encoding instruction to primary grade reading instruction. Explicit encoding instruction appears to be a missing link for students struggling with reading and spelling. Students taught to manipulate and or map graphene phoneme correspondences in these studies made greater improvements in word reading, 
fluency, comprehension, and spelling over contrast groups with robust and meaningful effect sizes. This clearly supports the theory of synergy between encoding and decoding instruction in reading and spelling ability in the early grades and with students with learning disabilities. Given the evidence as to the power of providing integrated, explicit encoding and decoding instruction to students who are struggling readers, the question that now needs to be addressed is how to ensure this type of instruction makes its way into today's classrooms. Thank you.